Thank you so much. Everybody can hear me? Yes. Great. So I'll keep this quick. I'll keep this punchy. Um, one just quick, fun question. How many of you are current Berkeley students? Oh, geez. This is going to be fun. Um, so a, a thought that I'll just plant is the relationships you're building today may last a lifetime. Uh, Archna from Splunk, I actually did undergraduate research for her doing canonical correlation analysis for kernel optimization and compilers. Uh, and James and Joanne, I actually started freshman year with. Both of us had a crush on Joanne. James is just better at life than me. That's why he married her. <laughs> uh, and probably why he's a VC and, and I'm just a founder. Um, <laughs> But so without further ado, I'd, I'd love to just kind of talk about my path, making a lot of money, serving a lot of ads, getting people to buy a lot of stuff on e-commerce, and eventually ending up realizing that data science could do more, could maybe help a few more people, and then going on to some of the people I know that are doing just incredible work to improve the world. So um, a, a little bit about myself. Uh, I did undergrad at Berkeley. Um, I actually met a guy at a talk like this called Andy Bechtelsheim. He'd founded Sun Microsystems. He was just starting a company called Arista Networks, and I thought, man, this guy's so smart. So I talked my way into the company. I was the youngest employee, and it was a $10 billion IPO. So it turns out just random halls in Berkeley can be very useful to you. Uh, I'd recommend talking to folks. And then we did a lot of really cool work. We did 200 nanosecond cut through data center switching. We did um, sub-microsecond FPGA-enabled algorithmic trading for high-frequency traders. We made a lot of people on Wall Street a lot of money. After that, I started an AI company that was scraping the web for selling things, so actually cars specifically. Great, great uh, technology. Kind of mediocre business model. Thankfully, in this economy, Google tried to buy us, then Facebook did. And I ended up running the Facebook e-commerce team for about three years. So um, if you've ever seen a product follow you around the internet, uh, I apologize. <laughs> Unless you're a stockholder, then you're welcome. Um, so I, I did that. It was a lot of fun. I mean, I, I, I truly have drank the Kool-Aid. I think Facebook's incredible. But I eventually got tired of it. You know, I said, wow, I was this Berkeley hippie back in the day. I had you know, dreadlocks. I lived in a co-op. And here I am serving toaster ads to people. What happened? Um, and so I, I quit. <laughs> I know, right? Uh, thank you, thank you. And so I, I, I quit. And I, I, I took this year off to kind of explore the world, get back to my roots. And I had some really unexpected experiences where uh, I was in Nepal in 2015 when that earthquake that, that killed a lot of people hit. Um, and I was, I was on Mount Everest with my friend Karma, who was a, a Sherpa. And we went back to his village and, and basically had to re-dig his house out and rebuild for a few months. Um, I, I spent three months really as an American, as someone that went to Berkeley, I was concerned about American occupation. I spent three months in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria. Uh, after that, I spent three months in Africa trying to understand aid and development. I came back with this idea that wow, there's such profound power that we have here and such influence, and there's so many better things we can use than just optimizing lead generation for business sales. And those, those are great, too, but there's so many good things. I just want to highlight a couple really profound places that you might look as inspiration, you might use as an idea, or you might even apply to work with uh, if you're looking to use your data science and skills that you're building today to really make the world better. So uh, without further ado, I want to talk about the first one of these. This is called the Human Diagnosis Project. This is my buddy, Jay Kumarneni, who, and the scope of his ambition is really, really incredible. Um, he sort of sat down and said, hey, you know, uh, I think similar to me, what, what could I do with my skills and my knowledge? And he realized that for most of us, the single most important thing is the health of those we love. And so he created this kind of crazy ambitious system where he said, well, Medicine and its knowledge is fragmented today, but it doesn't have to be. Can we create a coherent, open medical intelligence system that takes the symptoms and health of any patient and maps it to a diagnosis and a concrete set of steps that will make that person better? And he did this in a really clever way. So what it does is essentially, you know, there's like all these problems with medical. We get it. There's low signal. The, the data has errors. It's frequently unstructured. The why is not captured. And he made this really cool UX that essentially Physicians often want second opinions as well. And so what they do is they say, hey, okay, I'm going to enter in all the symptoms. I'm going to send it anonymously and with structured data to four to five other physicians. And then that physician will go through, and as the facts are revealed one at a time, they will rank the exact diagnosis they think it is, and they'll keep reordering it. So what this does is this creates a um, tremendous data set that allows you to figure out every single symptom, how much it should be weighted in the boosted decision tree or shrunken uh, uh, clustering or SVM that you want to use to impact a diagnosis. 
And this has had some really profound effects. So I just want to talk about two bits of evidence here. Uh, right here, with I, I can't share all the data, but with just 800 cases of patients presenting chest pain, you can train a system using SVMs that actually approaches the level of a medical student with just 800 cases. And here you can show, this is general data, you can actually show that you can up-level almost any physician or nurse or medical professional in the world, where if you're using this collaborative system, if you're using it, you are better than 90% of individual physicians working alone. And if you're using it plus the AI data augmentation that they've built, you are better than 97% of physicians. That is a profound impact. Um, and so that's pretty, pretty great. It's actually used by a third of all medical students for training today. Uh, and, and if you're interested, they're really looking for master's level and PhD data scientists that can make differences and they would love for you to apply. I've got Jay's email at the very end. He's an amazing guy. He's downtown SF. You should really talk to him. Um, next. So this is, this is ID Insight. I really like this one. Um, ID Insight is a, a group of people that actually came out of the Harvard Kennedy School. And they were doing a lot of random control trials and incredibly rigorous data science to figure out how can we empirically measure the impact of aid and government programs and show exactly how it works. And they realized that all this academic work wasn't getting translated to actual organizations doing the work. And so many of you may know this fact, but there's about $100 billion in aid spent every year, and the vast majority of it is completely without evidence. And that's just tragic. We are, we are leaving so many wins on the table for our fellow human beings, and we're already spending the money. And so uh, there's actually, there's, there's a guy from ID Insight here today. This is Ben. He cared about this so much, he's just been like lingering. <laughs> Seriously, hands up. No, wait for it. You're going to be more impressed. He spent the day lingering in the hall just with the hopes of talking to you all. But I, I, I don't know if Ben will like this description, but I kind of think of him as like the Indiana Jones of data science. Like he goes where it's needed to get it done. So Ben was just about the first hire for ID Insight, came right out of college, and they just immediately and without mercy shipped him off to Cambodia. And so his first project actually, three months in, uh, he was able to demonstrate through a random controlled trial that microfinance versus cash on delivery is able to sell four times as many sanitary systems and get four times the adoption rate as previous methods. So he was able to, to increase the uptake of a really fundamental basis of human health and sanitation immediately within three months. And then he went to Zambia and spent two years informing government decisions on how to treat and care for children with HIV. So a, a profoundly impactful thing that's changing the lives of many, many Zambians. He spent a lot of time there. You can see here, so this is, this is him in Zambia. I believe that this is sort of like the, the uh, data set he was given when he arrived, <laughs> if you want to call it that. Uh, and this was where he was in Cambodia. Um, you should really talk to him after this. He knows all the facts better than me. But it's incredible work. And, and it's interesting where th this has been such an effective way to drive change that you know, they started just a, a few years ago. There are 130 team members today, and there'll be 180 this year. And to show the size of the impact, uh, they're actually doing studies right now that land on the desk of the Prime Minister of India. So they're a, a very small team that is helping determine the policies that will affect one out of six people on the planet. I mean, this is, this is a profound place to use what you've learned to inform how people's lives change. And I want to talk about just a, a few of the things that they're moving into. So they're hiring this big data science team. Um, there's a lot of forward-looking statements here. Two of the things, actually there's, there's one from a professor at Berkeley where you can use uh, cell phone metadata to predict where people are. A, a huge problem in development is actually understanding where population centers of poverty are when it's an informal economy and there just aren't tax returns. So it's very difficult to do. And you can, you can do all these really clever tricks where you're actually using cell phone metadata to predict it. You can also do satellite imagery overlays where you're taking daytime photos to predict where the population centers are, and then nighttime photos to figure out nocturnal illumination rates, which correlates just as effectively as censuses to poverty rates. And so this is this incredible new technique that's just come out of academia between Berkeley and Stanford. These guys are using it. They need a lot of computer vision experts to help. And then I'll leave you with one last example that I think is like the coolest freaking application of AI I, I've heard in a long time, or, or machine learning to be more precise. Um, Saurabh would probably tell me I should use a boosted decision tree instead. But um, what they're doing is uh, there's this NGO in India that their whole mission is to go around and, and find young women that have dropped out of school and find them and get them back in school and catch them up and get them to succeed. And so this group is, is rather tenaciously going about it by knocking on doors. 
And they have knocked on over a million doors already. And there's some initial results from Ben that show with their new predictive analytics, you can double the rate of finding these young women and getting them back in school. So, I mean, if, if that's not showing that raising a new generation of Indian women that are schooled and educated and engaged is something worthwhile with data science, I don't know what is. So, uh, Ben, that's him. He's awesome. You should talk to him afterwards. Um, let's see. Okay, cool. This one's also really interesting. Anyone have a guess what spring does? It's in health. Anybody? Clean water. Clean water. Oh, man, that's a really good guess. Um, no, you're close. It's kind of like fountain of youth style. This is a really interesting one. I think you'll get a kick out of it, especially if you're kind of like nerdy like I am. So uh, this is another Ben. This is my buddy Ben Commons that was the first engineer at Khan Academy and a tremendous, smart, caring guy. He's lived with diabetes his whole life, and he's kind of come to the realization that, you know, much like Jay, the health of those you love is just about the most important thing for most people. But perhaps more ambitiously, he said, you know what? <laughs> Screw treating the symptoms. The underlying cause is the breakdown of our bodies, and it is preventable. And so there's all this really interesting studies, if you're looking at this right now, they're coming out that are saying, hey, with just two point mutations, you can make worms live six times as long. With just reducing the caloric intake of mice, you can increase their lifespan so that proportionally be as if a human lived to 150 to 160 years just by making them eat less. You guys ever heard of rapamycin? Okay, so this is like this like cool designer drug that a lot of people in Silicon Valley take. Um, if you, <laughs> I know, right? No, it's, it's like total Peter Thiel, heterochronic parabiosis, blood stuff. But um, it's, a, it's a drug, you can buy it today. Um, and if you give it to mice, it makes them live about 10% longer. And so this is, a mouse that would, how much they die if they don't have it, and this is how many are alive if have it. There's points where there are literally twice as many al mice alive that are taking rapamycin as not taking it. And these are things that are available today, but they're just not being acted on very quickly. And the reason is, as it turns out, aging is this massive, massive high dimensional problem. And so a lot of people do the, uh, you know, if you want to glorify it with the term of embedding, of saying, well, let's treat it as binary. When the model organism dies, that's when we'll say, you know, that's aging, they're dead. And it turns out that's just simply not true. You, you can do all these really interesting things. The insight from Ben is aging is this tremendously high dimensional system where you can say, hey, we're gonna look at cell histology. We're gonna look at behavioral patterns and activity. We're gonna look at the, the mass series of omics of what mutations are present in the genome, what RNA is being transcribed, what proteins and how are they edited from the RNA are being expressed and how are they present in the blood versus the cytosol, et cetera. And you can use this to create this incredibly compelling gradient of age, which instead of iterating an experiment taking it three years, you can have a continuous and high throughput assay that shows whether we have found a solution to the underlying cause of most human death and disease. So this is what they do. It's an incredibly smart team. It's funded by Eli Gill. He's kind of like the, the godfather of Silicon Valley. Um, if you're interested, uh, springdisc.com, uh, and, and I'm very happy to refer you. It's an incredible team doing a lot of really high dimensional cool data work. Um, this is probably not what you're expecting, but <laughs> there's a, a really specific thing I want to call out. Um, Facebook probably appropriately has been dragged through the mud on a couple things, but I, I just want a full caveat. I, I'm like not drinking the Kool-Aid, I'm swimming around in the Kool-Aid. And, <laughs> and um, there's, there's some really serious work being done by a couple friends there that this is, this is not an official Facebook presentation, but I just want to highlight as some place you might consider if you want to make a difference. Um, uh, this is about to get a little dark trigger warning. I'm, I'm going to talk about suicide. Um, so <sighs> suicide is, is really difficult. It's the number 10 cause of death in America. Uh, well, well, I've been talking to you, two people have killed themselves. It's not discussed. It should be discussed. It is a huge problem. And, you know, just sort of tying it in with a personal story. I have a friend that has called me multiple times saying that she can't go on and, and, and wants to end it. And, and thankfully, she has a support network of people like me and, and others. And, and I can talk her through it. But many people do not have that support network. And years ago at Facebook, we started observing this, and we, we didn't really know how to deal with it. And some engineers, thank God, volunteered to form a team where we identify people that are in a really difficult place 
And, and this is not like something anyone has to do. It's, it's just we felt it was right. And we have this whole series of, of actions that, that we try to get these people to where we engage them with a friend uh, or we refer them to a professional hotline. And actually, uh, a, about 100 times a month, we identify someone that is in the process of, of killing themselves, and we try to get the police there. And if we're quick enough, usually we can save a life. Um, so I, I realize that's a little dark, but um, this is a team that is doing some profound work where I can say very frankly, the couple engineers I know on that team have saved hundreds of lives each. Um, if you're ever interested in that, I'm, I'm happy to make the intro. It's, it's very important work. Um, maybe on a, a slightly lighter note, um, uh, Whisper is the company that, that I started, and, and it's, it's maybe not as life-saving as some of the stuff we've just talked about, but I, I think it can make a really big difference. So as mentioned, I got back from all my travels, and, and was really trying to look for something that, that could help people. And, and this journey sort of started when I realized I was, I was talking with my father, and he can no longer hear me when we go to a loud restaurant together. And I, I'd never realized this as a young man, but actually the way that hearing degrades is frequently that you lose the ability to pay attention. So it's really interesting that the hearing is not just perceiving quiet sounds, it's that the mechanism of attention, being able to focus in on just one conversation, is accomplished mechanically pre-neural transduction, and it breaks down as you age. So if you ever talk to an older person, frequently they just can't go to, to parties anymore because they can't understand anything. And so, you know, this this is about human connection. That's that's not a stock photo. That's a photo of my grandma. And she's she's just about the strongest woman I ever knew. And as a young man, I watched where, you know, she she was always the bedrock of, of any family social event. She's introducing people and routing people and making sure there's enough sweet potatoes and stuff like that. And, and slowly as, as she aged, she, she receded, where she was still sharp, but she just she couldn't understand you. She had to ask what a few times. She didn't get the joke anymore. And I, I could see her self-confidence ebb. And it's, you know, it's a little sad, but my grandfather passed, and she spent the last few years of her life largely alone with the television on, at the max volume. Um, so this is something I think that we can treat and we can change. And, and the fun part of this is that what I've described, the, the mechanism of hearing where you separate signal from background noise is eminently solvable with data. Um, oh, sorry, I forgot a slide. Um, one note is most of you in this room will experience hearing loss in your lifetime, so it's, it's, it's a pretty prevalent problem. Um, if, if you live long enough and if Ben's stuff of curing aging doesn't work, uh, probably all of us will, will need this at some point. But so I, I want to talk a little bit about you know, how much of a difference this can make. Um, hopefully the sound's on, but as mentioned, you know, it's really hard to, to separate sound, but it's eminently trackable at deep learning. So I'm going to play a couple samples of what we can do. We're a hearing aid company. Um, I forgot to mention, but we're, like, we're funded by Sequoia. We have the architect of the Apple AirPods. We stole them out of Apple to lead our hardware team. Um, we actually have significantly better results than other hearing aids. And so I'm going to play you some before and after samples to show what our algorithms can do. And these are from our actual test set. These are very representative of the results we can give to people with hearing problems. So this is a before. I will tell you what I think in my office. So it's, it's unpleasant. You can still put it together. And this is after. I will tell you what I think in my office. And you know, you're, you're all incredibly smart people, so you've probably deduced that it's actually fairly reasonable to handcraft something that would remove a sinusoidal wave from speech. Um, you know, that's always a good demo, though. But, but there's, there's some stuff we can do that, that wasn't previously possible until a couple years ago. Here's another example. I guess in voting control, Unusually high levels of radiation of were detected in many It's pretty hard to understand that, and it's very representative what you would experience with hearing aids in any restaurant today. This is after we're done with it. Unusually high levels of radiation were detected in many... And so again, that's from our test set. This is stuff we can do in real time, sub 10 millisecond embedded hardware, which is pretty tricky, but uh, with enough engineering can be done. And the results bear it out where, again, our, our goal is, is to really help people, not just make cool science experiments that we can put on PowerPoints. Um, this is a, a double-blind, 238 ratings per voice. Mean opinion score is kind of like a, a Yelp one to five star rating for audio. Uh, and word error rate is um, a, a transcription of the audio heard uh, so that we can actually know objectively how many words someone understood correctly. And you can see here, we're about 19, 20% than the best hearing aid that's ever existed using the new data science techniques that you're learning. So just a, a little bit about how we do it. 
I can't tell you exactly our algorithms because you know we're a, a company that's competing for a fifteen billion dollar market, but um, I can introduce the best paper in the field. So, how many people know what an embedding is? Yes, man, you guys are so much smarter than I was back in the day. Um, so, this is a spectrogram. What you essentially do is you take every single point here. And it's kind of interesting, like if you're really following in the weeds of machine learning, people have thrown away spectrograms, they're moving all to waveforms, and they actually have completely learned representations of frequency, which end up correlating very highly to human perception. Um, we do some of that, though much of the time, as mentioned, the fancy stuff is uh, better left for the academic papers, and, and you just deploy a much simpler model. And so what you can do is you can use an LSTM to project every single bin in that spectrogram onto a 20-dimensional hypersphere, which is you know, a fancy word for a unit normalized 20-dimensional uh, space. And then what you can do is you can actually just apply k-means clustering or any other uh, embedding separation technique to get the one voice from the other voice. So that's what we do. Um, there's a lot more engineering of making it real time. I actually spent about four months recoding TensorFlow into assembly. I didn't used to have a beard. Afterward, I did. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and, there's, and there's a lot of hardware to it. Um, so without further ado, uh, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to present. I'd encourage you, if you can, think about ways to improve the world. Thank you so much. And please let me know if I can ever be a resource to you. Dwight, thank you very much. Great way to wrap us up. We've got, a, we've got time for couple of questions if anyone would like to. Yes, let's take one right here in the row. I was assuming everyone was just going to run out for the beer, so I'm, I'm extremely flattered. Yeah. Um, thank you for sharing about so many organizations that have been founded to do good with data in mind. Uh -huh. um, I'm also very interested in the thousands of nonprofits that currently exist and are working to do good, but maybe didn't start with that data foundation. Yeah. Do you have thoughts about how we can be inserting data um, into those organizations and bringing oh, them up? man, what a great question. You know, I, I'm, I am truly speaking out of my, my um, expertise here. I'd probably refer you to Ben for that. But my initial thought would be many of these organizations have tons of data. They're on the ground. They know what's really going on. They know those details like, oh, of course those trucks are breaking down. We're driving them in the field way out of range. They know that stuff that you can only understand if you're truly in it. Uh, but they don't necessarily have access to these best in practice techniques. Um, I would hope that there's sort of like a pro bono equivalent of data scientists that starts manifesting and can volunteer with these groups. Although again, uh, I think there's a chance that with this increasing education movement, there can be ubiquity of data science such that every organization is empowered to do good work. All right. We have a question right here. Just, just wait for the, the mic. Here we go. Thanks. Uh, this is a much more specific question, but yeah. just about your. Uh, yeah, hearing aids. Yeah, are you able to deal with when you're talking like with three, two, or three, or even four yeah. people? Yeah. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked. Okay, so, um, sorry. Uh, so one of the really interesting things about this, and we had to design it in such a way that it's speaker independent, works on people you've never heard before, noises you've never heard before, and potentially unknown groups of speakers. So what we can do is because it's an embedding space. Um, you can actually do a number of inferences which figure out how many speakers there are, and there's very good techniques that are known for doing that. Uh, and then what you can do is just do k-means clustering with different numbers. And a lot of the way you can be clever is, again, previous hearing aid generations really only use about 500 milliseconds of context to infer what you should be listening to. We can take the last few minutes and do things like, oh, well, I talked and you talk, I talked and you talk. We're statistically correlated, whereas the people at the adjacent table are not. We've actually got a fun patent on that that you know, who knows if we'll get approved, but it's pretty cool. Um, so that's a lot of how we think about it. And again, uh, most of the existing hearing aids are incredibly basic. You know, they're using techniques used for missile defense in the 40s, actually, as their primary algorithms. We're just saying, hey, look, we're out running this ossified dinosaur. Um, almost anything is going to be better. Okay, I think it might right. be beer time. We're there. All right. Dwight, thanks again. Thank you all so much.